Hey everybody, how's it going? This is Ramina Zarm, owner and operator of Flex to Success Clinical Rehabilitation Services. I'm really excited today because I get to do a discussion on major depressive disorder. Great video, had a lot of encounters with this disorder over my 10 to 15 year career as a social worker. Encountered so many people suffering from depression. It is the number one reason why people seek out mental health treatment. A lot of people don't know that, but depression is a huge problem in the United States. And um, it excites me to do this video because I hope it'll give people more insights in how to deal with this illness since it's so prevalent. First off, I want to define major depressive disorder. Major depressive disorder, or also known as MDD, which is probably how I will say it in this video, just because it's shorter and easier for time purposes. MDD is a mental illness characterized by a persistently depressed mood and long-term anhedonia or loss of interest in life. Anhedonia means when you have lost pleasure in doing activities or things that normally brought you pleasure in the past. So if you really enjoy doing jujitsu like I do or playing basketball and then all of a sudden you play those sports and you have absolutely no interest in them whatsoever, that's what anhedonia is. It's a state of low mood where you just lose the desire or pleasure to want to engage in anything. Sex, sports, anything that's pleasurable. The duration usually lasts about two weeks. Um... And some other common symptoms with major depressive disorder are poor sleep or disturbed sleep, not able to maintain a REM state of sleep, feelings of guilt or inadequacy, suicidal thoughts, a lot of uh, self-isolation. So when dealing with MDD, there's about nine criteria that you have to meet according to the DSM-5. And like I've said before in my other videos... My information comes from the DSM-5 because that's evidence-based, and I only like to use sources that are evidence-based. So out of the nine criteria, the first criteria is depressed mood for most of the day, nearly every day. And usually what this means is the, the patient or the person experiencing MDD will talk about feelings of sadness, feelings of emptiness, feelings of hopelessness. That's usually what you'll see. My life is empty. I have no meaning. I have no purpose. Everything feels hopeless. I have no desire to see what's going to happen in the future. You know, very pessimistic and just focused on the negative. Observations um, that can be made by others when dealing with somebody who has MDD. So a lot of times they'll be tearful. Um, they'll just start crying in sessions, um, therapy sessions. They'll cry when they're hanging out with friends. They'll just start crying, sobbing, hysterical, sometimes hysterical, sometimes not. Um, you will definitely see a very tearful affect from somebody who's experiencing MDD. That's common. Also, it's important to note that um, in children and adolescents, you might see more irritable mood, like a lot of irritable mood rather than tearfulness and crying as much. Like you, you'll see both, but you'll probably see more irritable mood if you're dealing with an adolescent or a child, which can make it a little more confusing to diagnose this earlier in life. Usually people with MDD are diagnosed as adults. They're not usually diagnosed as children. That's important to note as well. The second criteria is markedly diminished interest or pleasure in all or almost all activities. Most of the day, nearly every day. And a lot of that can be assumed by subjective analysis, meaning like somebody who's a professional or just a friend or neighbor who's just noticing this about you. Um, also, uh, in clinical observation, that's usually how you would notice if somebody has markedly diminished interest in activities. They would say, 
I just don't enjoy playing sports. I just don't enjoy doing these things anymore. They're not fun for me. I don't see any reason to continue doing them. I I want to quit. I, I you know wanting to just all of a sudden quit things you know spontaneously. Um, many times that will have connections to MDD. It's also important that um you, you a few things to note. One, you have to have five or more of these nine criteria in order to have major depressive disorder. So if you're just having one or two of these, that doesn't mean that you have MDD. So that's important to note. And also, you should hear out all the criteria in its entirety before you make a decision on whether you might have this or not. Don't just listen to like one or two criteria and assume that like, oh, I definitely have MDD because I have those two. Listen to all nine criteria, hear me out, and then make an informed decision after you've heard all the criteria because it's very easy to misdiagnose MDD. So the third criteria is significant weight loss when, when not dieting or weight gain. Usually this is about 5% of body weight in a month. So that's pretty significant. Think about if you're 100 pounds, that's gaining five pounds in a month. So you would go from 100 pounds to 105 pounds in one month. Five pounds in a month is a lot. That's a big weight swing. So if you're noticing that your patients or your friends or your neighbors are gaining weight, of course, before you want to jump to the fact that they have MDD, you want to rule out any medical conditions that could be causing that first. You don't just want to jump to conclusions. Oh, that person's depressed. You want to hear the whole story, but it wouldn't be a bad thing to say, hey, you know, is there a possibility that you've been feeling depressed lately? I've noticed that your weight's been shifting drastically. I know that that's a symptom of, you know, clinical depression. Have you thought about maybe seeing someone or getting evaluated? And if they're totally opposed to it, you could just leave it alone at that point. But if they are interested, you might have just sparked interest for them to look forward to look more into it. Um, and that's what you really want when it comes to, you know, exposing people to treatments to help improve their mental health. You just want them to kind of look at something that they're doing and question it. And if that leads them down the road of getting treatment for an actual condition, hey, that's great. If that just means they have to change one or two things in their lives, that's great too. But we just want to have the awareness to help people become to make informed decisions and to be more aware of what they might be experiencing. So significant weight gain or weight loss, usually 5% of the body weight. Criteria number four, insomnia or hypersomnia nearly every day. So if you're having trouble sleeping every single day, there is a possibility that you might have MDD or you're at the very least experiencing depression. You know, if you can't get yourself to sleep, that's a serious problem. You know, sleep, our ability to function branches directly off of how well asleep we get. If we're not sleeping on a consistent basis, you're going to see significantly marked impairment in abilities to function, whether that be at a job, at a sport, as a parent, regardless, any type of functioning will be affected if you're not sleeping properly. So if you're having hypersomnia, which is excessive sleep, or if you're having insomnia, which is a lack of being able to sleep, either one of those nearly every day, it would definitely be appropriate to question whether you have depression or not. If it, you know, MDD is a severe form of clinical depression, and it's important to also note that with MDD, there's mild moderate and severe. So you can have mild MDD, moderate or severe. If you have severe MDD, these criterias will be a lot more noticeable. If you have mild MDD, they're going to be a lot less noticeable, but still noticeable. So you'll still have these, but maybe they won't be as intense. Okay. The fifth criteria is psychomotor agitation or retardation nearly every day. What, what do they mean by psychomotor agitation or psychomotor retardation? It means that you're very restless and that you're making like 
body movements that are somewhat bizarre, not your normal body movements. So you might be tensing up a lot or you might be, you know, scratching at yourself or you might be just pacing all the time, not able to sit still. And it gets confusing because people with ADHD have a hard time sitting still. So that's why it's important to look at all the criteria because you don't want to just assume that somebody's depressed when they might have ADHD and vice versa. So um, it's a you know it is important to note that you know restlessness and psychomotor agitation, pacing, clenching of fists, tensing up, those are all symptoms of depression. Doesn't necessarily mean that you have depression or that depression is the cause of those symptoms, but it is a a red flag sign. Criteria number six, fatigue or loss of energy nearly every day. So if you're feeling tired all the time, if you're always laying down, if you're always wanting to sleep. Now, listen, if you're not sleeping well at night, you're going to probably feel that way. So if you start to get better sleep and that goes away, you probably don't have major depressive disorder. It's probably just the fact that you weren't sleeping. But People who have MDD, even if they get proper sleep, they still feel a loss of energy. They still feel fatigued, even if they have the best sleep, even if they sleep, you know, nine, ten hours straight REM sleep, they'll still have those feelings. So that's important to note as well that, you know, just because you have fatigue or loss of energy doesn't necessarily mean that you have MDD. And I'm just highlighting that because I know how, how common it is for people to throw labels around and how easy it is for people to just label somebody as something because then it just makes it easier for that person to just categorize them. But you always want to, as a clinical professional, you always want to rule out medical conditions before you make any type of a mental health diagnosis. And you also want to consider all the criterias together before you come to a conclusion of what somebody might be diagnosed with. The next criteria is feelings of worthlessness or excesses of excessive or inappropriate guilt. So what does that mean? So I had a child in therapy once who told me that they were devastated to the point where they didn't leave their room for a day or two because their father had bought them candy. And the, the child ate the candy like really quickly. And then the dad asked the child for a piece of candy and there was no candy left in the bag. So the child got extremely upset and the dad asked the child for a piece of candy. And when the child didn't have any, the dad got upset like, oh, I... I was expecting you to save me one or two. I didn't expect you to eat them so quickly. But, you know, the dad wasn't really making a big deal about it. He was just kind of like, oh, I thought you were going to save me some, you know. This child went berserk, but not like in the sense that you would think. He just, he secretly cried about it, refused to leave his room, felt extremely guilty about it. And this feeling carried on for days. So, you know, that child, to make a long story short, was diagnosed with MDD. And I just wanted to give an example of, like, the type of guilt that, like, a child might feel when they're diagnosed with MDD. Um, and, you know, guilt can be a very complex thing. It can be a very... It can be difficult to explain sometimes, so I thought if I gave an example, maybe it'll help people understand like the type of guilt. Like This isn't just like your average, like, oh, I feel bad, I did something wrong, and then five seconds later, you're fine about it. Like If you're feeling guilt as a result of MDD, like that guilt is going to persist. It's going to be intense, and it's going to really affect you internally. So if you're someone who's prone to that, you might be prone to depression. The next criteria is diminished ability to think or concentrate or indecisiveness. Now, again, this can be a symptom of many other illnesses, ADHD, 
Um, there are people with anxiety disorders who have an inability to concentrate because they're so anxious. The same is also true for depression. You can, you ha can have diminished ability to think or concentrate. You can be very indecisive and that'll happen nearly every day. Again, this is one of those things that can be subjectively observed by others or in a clinical setting observed by a clinical professional. And usually that will go by things that you're saying. A lot of times people with MDD will say, I'm having a hard time making decisions. I don't know what to do. It's really creating a lot of stress for me and frustrating me. And then they'll say it's causing me to isolate and do other things that are also familiar signs of depression. So it kind of, the red light kind of goes off for the therapist, like, oh, okay. Like, it's interesting how they're experiencing this one thing and it's connected to all these other things that seem to be under the umbrella of depression. So that's how a clinical professional comes to conclude making a diagnosis. They look at the whole picture instead of just like one specific little detail. Okay, what does this detail branch off to? Oh, and all these things that they're feeling are all criteria of depression and they're experiencing these things almost every day. It starts to become a clearer picture of what this person's experiencing. Um, so the last criteria is recurrent thoughts of death, recurrent suicidal ideation without a specific plan or a suicide attempt or a specific plan for committing suicide. So what does that basically mean? If you're having recurrent feelings of wanting to kill yourself, if you're having, if you have, if you're spending a lot of time creating a plan on how to kill yourself, if you have actually attempted suicide before, either by hanging or cutting your wrists or drug overdosing, there is a chance that you might have MDD and that you could be experiencing depression. But again, there's lots of other illnesses out there where you have suicidal ideations, you experience suicide attempts, you have recurrent thoughts of death or dying. You know, there are people who, when they're grieving, when they're going through the grieving process, they experience things like that. What makes it different for depression is the intensity. You know, how often are you having recurrent thoughts of suicide? How often are you thinking about death? How often? And is there a trigger? You know, my dad just died. Okay, I was super close with my dad. All right. Now, once you get over, or I mean, I guess you never really get over the death of a close family member, but once you start to navigate through the stages of loss, and I did a video on Kubler, Kubler Ross's stages of loss, once you get through the denial, the anger, the bargaining, the acceptance, once you go through all of those, do you still feel suicidal? Do you still feel that could be a precursor for depression? If you go through the stages of loss after losing a loved one and you still feel suicidal, even though you've accepted the fact that they've passed on and you're somewhat okay with it, right? That's something to look into. Like, why do I still feel suicidal? Why do I still feel like I want to hurt myself? Why do I still have a desire for self-harm or suicidal ideation? Um, it could be depression. So, again, like you want to... You want to be aware of the, you want to take a step back and be aware of the whole picture of what's going on and not just a specific detail. And I know I've emphasized that numerous times throughout this video, but it's super important if you're a clinical professional and you're trying to diagnose somebody. You don't want to diagnose somebody off of a part of a criteria. You want to diagnose somebody looking at the whole picture and seeing if they actually do meet the criteria. So those are the nine criteria for major depressive disorder. And I hope you like the example that I gave. I have a story of encountering um, major depressive disorder from a peer when I was in college. I had a good friend in college and he was a straight A student. He was an excellent social worker. He was doing really well in all of his classes. We were progressing along beautifully. Both of us were doing really well. We took a lot of the same classes together. We spent a lot of time together studying at school. 
And I remember he had a death in his family. And he knew as well as I knew, like, okay, you had someone close to you and your family die. It might be better for you to take some time off school, take some time off work, deal with the fact that the family member died, take your time, recover, come back, do what you have to do, maintain, you know, carry on with your responsibilities, and we deal with it and move on as best as we can, right? So he did all that. He came back to school. He was never the same. He was never the same. His grades plummeted. He was having a hard time concentrating on his studies. We would study together and he would openly admit this, like, I'm not retaining any information right now. And I would repeatedly say to him, like, is it because of the death you had in your family? And he would just say, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I don't know. I just, I feel like I can't do this anymore. Uh, this whole school thing, I'm just not feeling it. I'm not, you know. So then I would, I would say, okay, fine. Why don't, why don't we do this? Why don't you read a paragraph? Instead of trying to read like 50 pages at once, why don't you just read a paragraph? I'll ask you questions about the paragraph to see how much you retained. If you didn't retain that much, you could read the paragraph again. We'll do it again. And then we'll go to the next paragraph. And we had to learn the same material. So, you know, I had read to a certain point already and I was ahead of him. And he was kind of still stuck on an earlier assignment. So I said, you know what? I've already done this assignment. Let me help you with this. And I tried to help him with it. And he wasn't retaining anything from what he was reading. And it was bizarre to me because I knew how intelligent he was. And I knew that there was something more that was wrong. Make a long story short, I suggested that he go and see somebody. And I was being totally like, honest with him. Like I said, I really feel like you're dealing with something right now that is beyond the grief that you experienced from the family member who passed away. I really think that you could benefit from seeing somebody to kind of find out what is further going on inside of you that's causing you to be so unable to focus on your studies. Because this isn't like you. This is something that's abnormal. Like you were never this person. You were, you were the one who always motivated me and like you know, I, I know that this isn't you and I know that there's something else wrong. So, you know, please check it out. So at first he got a little defensive and he didn't check it out, but we still talked and we were still cool. You know, eventually he did get checked out and he was diagnosed with major depressive disorder. And that was why even after he, his loved one passed away, he was still having difficulties. And I think there was a lot of other things that might have been going on that he didn't share with me because he was embarrassed. Maybe he was having thoughts of death. Maybe he was having all these other things happening. But my point is that a death in the family can sometimes trigger a major depressive episode where all of a sudden you're experiencing all the criteria of major depressive disorder because this death in the family triggered it and caused all these symptoms to come out. So you never know what's going to happen to you in life that's going to uncover like what diagnoses you might have. Or maybe you just don't have any diagnoses of anything. And that's fine too. You know, whatever the case may be is fine. It's just a matter of how are you going to treat it? How are you going to handle it once you know that there's something more wrong? In this particular example, my colleague, he went and got some help. He went and got help. And unfortunately, he ended up dropping out of school and he just decided that the whole thing was too stressful for him. And he took his life a totally different direction. And that's good for him. That's great. He's happy now. He's doing what he has to do. He's taking medication. And he's good. And I'm glad that, you know, he, he responsibly treated the problem. But not everybody does that. There's a lot of people in this country, probably 20 million people in this country approximately are suffering from depression. How many of them are getting help for it? I would assume that 20 million people are not all seeking treatment for their depression. There's a lot of people out there that are undiagnosed and there's a lot of people out there who are just trying to ignore these symptoms and move forward. And the problem with that is something is going to happen one day that's going to trigger a really deep rooted, you know, if you have major depressive disorder, something's going to happen one day that's going to trigger a major depressive episode and you're going to be experiencing all these things and you're going to be really confused and upset. And my advice to people like that is get yourself some help, get yourself some treatment, get into therapy, get on some medication if it requires you to do so, if it's severe enough. But, you know, 
don't jump to medication. First try talk therapy. First try coping skills. First try developing a, a social support network, a positive social support network. Get yourself out there and join a sport. Pick a hobby. Engage in your community. Put yourself out there and try to get some Try to see if those things alleviate it, alleviate your depression first. If you can't get any alleviated symptoms from doing all those things, then yeah, maybe you should consider medication. Maybe that would be the next step. But never jump to medication as like your primary go-to anytime you're feeling a certain type of way. Human beings are very resilient. Not everyone is experiencing severe forms of depression and some people can alleviate their symptoms of depression just by changing their environment and changing their mentality and changing um how they operate through life you know maybe you have a job that's like super stressful and because you have this underlying depression that job is you know triggering your depression constantly and causing you to be like a sad you know, isolated person. So, okay, fine. Change that job. Do something that doesn't trigger your depression. You might realize, wow, I can manage this depression on my own. I don't need medication. I don't need someone in my ear, you know? Okay, good for you. Great. If you can alleviate your depression that way, that's awesome, you know? But if you can't, you know, there are tools out here to help you. There are therapists like myself, there's medication, psychotropic medications. Some of the medications that work for depression is Zoloft. Um, another antidepressant is Lexapro. And of course, there are SSRIs. SSRIs are serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And they are probably the best medications on the market to deal with severe depression. The way SSRIs work is that they work on the, 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 the monoamine deficiency theory. So what is the monoamine deficiency theory? So amine, right, is a derivative of ammonia. So a derivative of ammonia with, you know, would be like NH2. So like serotonin. Is a, is a monoamine. Norepinephrine is a monoamine. Dopamine is a monoamine. Why are they a monoamine? Because in their molecules, they all have NH2. NH2 is a derivative of, of ammonia, which is NH3. What is NH3? N is nitrogen, H is hydrogen, right? So NH2, one part nitrogen, two part hydrogen. NH3, one part nitrogen, three part hydrogen. Okay, ammonia or derivatives of ammonia have a calming effect on the body. So that's why the medications that are SSRIs, they're, what their goal is, is that there's a synapse right between two cells. The goal of the medication is to keep the serotonin production heavy in the synaptic cleft. The synaptic cleft is what holds the serotonin so that the body can utilize it throughout, right? And the, the body can, the brain can utilize the serotonin to maintain steady mood, right? Non-depressed mood. So if you didn't take the medication, what would happen is the serotonin wouldn't stay in the synaptic cleft. It would just be redistributed back into the neuron. So... Same thing with norepinephrine and same thing with dopamine. Why is serotonin important? Serotonin is important because the more serotonin that you have, the less amount of obsessions and compulsions you will have. A lack of serotonin is very common for people who have obsessive compulsive disorder, who are constantly compulsing and obsessing about certain things. Norepinephrine is for anxiety and attention. So a lack of norepinephrine would create a lot of anxiety and a lot of inattention. So that's another important one. So that, you know, one of the um, criteria for depression was what? Diminished ability to think or concentrate, 
What was another criteria? Psychomotor agitation. So by having norepinephrine in the synaptic cleft, you will have less anxiety and you'll be more attentive. So that one's really important. Dopamine is for attention, motivation, and pleasure. <laughs> Self-explanatory. Of course we want to have dopamine in the synaptic cleft, right? Because we want to be able to enjoy things, especially things that we normally enjoy, right? If you remember in the beginning, we talked about anhedonia and how people lose, ple lose the pleasure of enjoying things that they normally enjoy. If you, have a, if you have sufficient dopamine production, you won't experience anhedonia. Everything that you enjoy doing, you'll continue to enjoy doing it. But when there's a lack of dopamine, that'll happen, where things just don't feel enjoyable. It's like you're just going through the motions and doing things. Nothing's enjoyable. You get no beauty or benefit out of anything. And that's a very hard, cold way to live. And me personally, I wouldn't want to live that way. So if I had MDD, I would take medication because I wouldn't want to go through life that way, just going through the motions. It's just not satisfying. Um, all these SSRIs, these are the, the neurotransmitters that they assist with. Serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. It keeps them in the synaptic cleft so they don't get reabsorbed by the neuron. And as long as the neurotransmitter stays in the synaptic cleft, the human being gets benefit from those neurotransmitters. Once they're back reabsorbed back into the neuron, the body can no longer utilize them for production. So then you'll notice brain changes and mood changes um, as a result of not having those neurotransmitters in circulation. So that's the monoamine deficiency theory that people who are experiencing depression have a deficiency in either serotonin, norepinephrine, or dopamine. And the reason why SSRIs are evidence-based is because they increase the production of those three neurotransmitters so that they can alleviate feelings of depression. So this is my video on major depressive disorder. I hope everybody got something out of this. I was really excited to do this one. I, I specialize in helping people with depression. Um, if you are ever in the area and you are in need of counseling or therapy, please feel free to reach out. My number is 631-618-5940. I am the owner and operator of Flex to Success Clinical Rehabilitation Services, and I'm signing off. Take care, everybody. Have a great day.